If you have a Bible, please turn to Colossians 1 this evening. Colossians 1, we're in a series entitled, How Big Is Your God? How Big Is Your God? And tonight we discover he's big enough to guide my life. Colossians 1. One of the most common questions that, that pastors are asked is, how can I know God's will for my life? How can I know if I'm making the right decisions? And the Christian's goal is to know and to do the will of God. Uh, this is how we, we glorify God in our lives, walking in his will and in his truth. Stand with me, please, as I read from Colossians chapter 1. Just a, a tremendous uh, challenge and instruction for us regarding uh, that God is big enough to guide each one of us in our life. Colossians 1 verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. May we pray. Father, we, we desire to walk in your will. We desire to know more about you and about your ways. We desire to, to have faith and to be able to walk in that faith and obedience to please you, to walk worthy. Now, Father, we, we are faced with so many decisions, small and big, and I pray that as we consider the different choices that we make in life, that we will always consider what your will is for our lives. So may we be filled with that wisdom and knowledge that we might be guided to walk worthy and please you. If there be one here tonight and they've not yet been saved, work in their heart, draw them to yourself, whether they be watching online or here. Thank you for those taking steps of faith in salvation to you today. God, help us to see them grow, discipled, and baptized. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. When you are obeying God to the best of your ability, when you are seeking to live by faith and love and serve and honor God, I fully believe, if that's the desire of your heart, I fully believe that God in his sovereignty intervenes in your life uh, by opening and closing doors. Uh, but God only steers a moving car. If you go out and get in your car tonight and you pull out into 113, it says you're entering the mission field, you make a right turn, and then you stop. If you just stop, you're not going to know what's down the road. God does not steer a stopped car. He steers a moving car. And so you have to, you have to, to, to travel down the road 50 feet make a left turn on Mennonite Road and you go a little bit farther and every time you go forward and you see that 50 feet, then the headlights on a dark night illuminates the next 50 feet. You can't expect God to show you the next step in your life, the will of God in your life, if you're not moving forward in faith and obedience. God will show you what's around the bend. But if you refuse to move forward in obedience, why would you expect God to reveal the next step? Look with me at verse 9. For this cause, Paul says, we pray for you. We do not cease to pray for you. And here's the prayer. To, to, to desire that you might be filled with what? With the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And Paul uses this word filled several times in the book. And it means you will be fully equipped that you will know and understand God's will. It's used of a, of a ship that's getting ready to go into a long voyage. They fill it up with cargo. They fill it up with supplies. They might be out on the, on the seas for weeks or even a couple of months, and they're filled with everything they need for the journey. Paul says, my prayer is that God is gonna fill you up with everything you need in order for the journey of life and your walk with God. Verse 10, why would we pray for you to have this understanding? <coughs> that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increased in the knowledge of God. 
Paul says when that happens, when you're filled with this understanding, you will live a life that honors God. How do we please him? Uh, Two ways are listed here. Doing good works and growing in the knowledge of God. I think that's interesting. He says that after we know God's will, we please him. How? By doing God's will. And then you will come to know God even better. Look at the fruit of this in verse 11. Strengthened, as you do this, as you know God's will and you do God's will, you're fulfilling good works, you're increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, God's God's might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. God is going to bring joy in your life as you have patience on this Christian journey. As that happens, you'll grow in the knowledge of God. Years ago, Paul Crouch, head of a Christian cable network, he once said, we don't need theology. We don't need theology. Do you know what theology is? Theology is the study of who? God. Mr. Crouch said, we don't need to study and learn about God. His network was all about experience, speaking in tongues, baptized in the blue flame. Let's accept everybody's teaching. It's funny how they are accepting of everyone's teaching except for Christians who believe in sound doctrine. And then, then we gotta stop that. The challenge of knowing God's will and hearing God's voice is that we're not always certain it's him. Every one of us have wrestled with decisions and we wondered, are we, are, are we, are we doing the right thing here? Is, is this God's leading? Is this what God wants me to do? I, I heard the story about the, uh, the pastor and he was working on his sermon at home and, and uh, it was before computers and he had his Bible and he had his tablet, his yellow, yellow tablet out and he's writing notes and his little son crawled up in his lap and and he said, uh, Daddy, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm preparing the sermon to preach God's word to God's people. And he said, Daddy, does, does God tell you what to, to write? He said, yes, he does. He does. Daddy, why do you keep scratching out the things that God tells you what to write? <laughs> you know, is, is this really what God said or not? And, and uh, anybody who's prepared a lesson to teach or preach, you, you type it out, then you highlight it, and you hit delete, and you edit it, and you want to make sure that, that it, you're rightly dividing God's truth. Have you ever wondered, is, is, is that God that put that thought in my mind? We look at the Apostle Paul, the great missionary. Do you know that he had the same struggle? The Apostle Paul didn't always know the voice of God right away. On Paul's second missionary journey, he came through the province of Asia. He sensed that's not where he should be. He endeavored to go to Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit forbade him to go that way. Now, we're not told what hindered him. It could have been circumstances. It could have been a vision. It could have been a dream. But we know that he is not to go that way. He is not to go east. And then he had a vision in the night. He saw a man of Macedonia from northern Greece come over and help us. And that's exactly where God wanted him to go. He wanted him to go west on his missionary journey. And so he took Luke and Timothy, and because of that, we are here tonight. And basically, America has been evangelized in our history because of that decision. Instead of Paul going east, he went west, and the gospel came to all of Europe. Sometimes it took Paul a little while to know exactly what God was wanting. That's called a walk of faith. And if it happened to Paul, it's gonna happen to us. So what are the guidelines for finding God's guidance? I know this is a review for for some of you tonight, but it's important. Uh, Many of you right now, you might be struggling or wrestling with with all types of decisions. Uh, Maybe it's a job, maybe you're single, uh, maybe you're looking for God's direction in your marriage. Maybe it's a financial decision, a career decision, a spiritual decision. Many of you are in a waiting room and you're just waiting, what is the next step? of God's guidance. Well, number one, clearly it is the Bible. Search the scriptures. We always begin with God's word. The will of God and the word of God go together. Psalm 119, 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. God's desire is that we sin less and less and less, and we need God's word to be able to do that. God's word reveals his light to me. You don't need to pray, God, shall I get baptized? Shall I I join the church? Should I be a part of what you're doing? 
No, no, we just need to be obedient. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a light into my path. God's written will is God's written word. And many times, many times God leads us and gives us the desires of our heart when you are surrendered to God, sold out to God, you placed all on the altar of sacrifice, God can lead you even through your desires. But those desires always need to be checked, scrutinized by the word of God. Does it pass the test? Uh, does it line up with the Bible? Uh, too many Christians make the mistake of playing Bible roulette. And I've heard it, and you've probably heard it as well. We take the Bible, we close our eyes, and we kind of do this kind of a thing. And we point it and say, okay, what is God's message for me? And, and maybe you've heard it said where the fella did that, and, and uh, uh, you're feeling kind of low, and you're looking for a word from God, and you, and, and you put it down, and it says, Judas went out and hung himself. Say, oh, no. So you, you flip it open again, you try again, and then it says, go and do thou likewise. And so, so you flip it again and you point again, and it says, what thou doest, do quickly. All right, uh, that's Bible roulette. That is not how God leads us. That's not rightly dividing the word of God accurately. We're not to just pull out a verse here and there. We need to understand the historical uh, and the context of what God is saying to help, him, uh, to help us f make a decision. Let the word of God lead you in its context and understanding. First guideline, the word of God. Second guideline is obedience to God himself. Uh, there's a tendency for Christians who've been saved a long time to think, well, we know how God operates. I've been saved for decades. Uh, we think we have, have God all figured out, and, and we say, well, God, he does it this way, and he does it that way. What we really need, what we really need is his steady hand on our shoulder, and we need him to guide us as we hear the word of God, to walk in the word daily. Remember what Mary uh, said there at the wedding, Jesus had not done any miracles, but Mary knew that this is the son of God, and she said to the servants of the wedding, whatever he says to you, what? Do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. And that's good advice for us today. Too many Christians make the Christian life too complicated. Just keep it simple. Uh, do what he tells you to do. You and I know when we're not doing right. Uh, you know when you are sinning. You know when you're disobedient. Uh, you know what you're not really doing, what he wants you to do. You go days. You go weeks, and you don't even open the Bible. How can you, how can you be reminded of what, what God wants you to do if you're not daily in the Word? We need to be in God's Word. We get a hold of something that is sinful, and we say, I, I don't think it's too bad. Uh, instead of being a follower of Jesus, we become a negotiator. Uh, whatever he says, we just need to do it. We're all too educated beyond our level of obedience. Just do it. Just obey God. Uh, don't get so close to the edge and see how close can I get to sinning without sinning. Just stay back in the center of God's will. Camp there. You see, every time you sin, you, you dull your sensitivity to sin. You dull your spiritual eyesight. You dull your spiritual ears. It's kind of like uh, uh, if, you, if you travel away from the area, you have the radio on, and maybe you're listening to a Christian station or some news, and the farther you get away, what happens is you begin to hear what on the radio? A little static. You're too far away from the signal. And the farther away you get, the more the static, and worse, you can pick up the wrong station. And when you get away from God, and you get away from obeying God, you're going to pick up the wrong signal. And so you need to stay close to the Lord. Number three, surrender to God's commands and God's ways. In order to receive direction from God, what's he saying here is you want to walk worthy, you want to walk in obedience. If you want to receive God's direction, you need to be willing to receive correction from God. And it's during correction that we begin to submit our will to his will. We begin to surrender to him. The first step in knowing the will of God is unconditional surrender. Many of us pray, God, God, show me your will so that we can decide whether or not we want to do it. 
We pray, oh God, show me your will. Please reveal your will. Show me what I'm supposed to do. And he does. And we look at that and say, oh God, I didn't mean that. Can you show me something else? Don't pray, Lord, show me your will. Please, please, please. And then not do it. Take all of your desires. <coughs> Take your will. Take, put it all together and you place it at the foot of the cross. You lay it there and say, God, I give this to you. My job is surrender. Your job is surrender. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do when you have, you've already determined, I want to do this, and I want to do it this way. So many of you have heard the story. Some may not have heard it, but going back a few years, uh, 1995, uh, Jody and I were, were writing. We had not met. We had not talked on the phone. Uh, we hadn't texted, hadn't emailed, uh, but we were writing letters uh, for about three months, and the Lord kind of began to knit our hearts together, and I, I, in one letter, I invited her here, and in a letter, she invited me there, and then the next letter, I uh, uh, wrote a couple of dates and offered and then crickets. I mean, everything's been going great for almost three months, and, and now we have the dates, and, and nothing's happening, and all kinds of thoughts began swimming in my mind, first and foremost being, now that she has moved back from home, she, was, she graduated college, she was out on her own teaching at a, in the city of Barrie, and, and, and then she had moved back home to help her dad start a Christian school, and, and now she's under his roof again. And, and so my, uh, my assumption was that her parents thought it was fine to write a guy in another country, fine to write a guy who's got a couple of kids, but have him come and visit, I don't know that that's fine. I began to think that, that if it's not Jody, then I just need to take this idea of remarriage after being widowed and just kind of put it on hold. Focus on raising my two little boys. Focus on being your pastor. But I knew we just couldn't keep writing if this isn't going nowhere. And so I got on my knees when the first date came. I offered two dates the first day came, I got on my knees in my bedroom and I surrendered to being single. I wanted to be married, but I surrendered to being single. And that was, that was hard. I, uh, the next day I thought, well, uh, we just can't keep writing. So I, I dialed 411. Do you remember what 411 is? Information. They even had it in Canada. And uh, so I, I uh, discovered Pastor John Friesen's phone number. I called that evening, and Paul, who was a teenager, actually answered the phone. He can't remember it, but uh, uh, he answered the phone. And uh, Jody's dad came on the phone, and very quickly after uh, chatting a little bit, he asked me this question about you and Jody. Do you think this is of God? I said, absolutely. <laughs> you want to know God's will? Just ask me. I'll tell you. This is God's will. He said, we'd love to have you come and visit. Would you like to talk to Jody? And she got on the phone, and with her Canadian accent, she said, hello, Scott. Hanging on the wall in our bedroom is a sign that says, you had me at hello. <laughs> and so a week later, I was on a plane, went to Canada. We met, and uh, three days later, came back, and I called her every day until we were married, June 15, 1996. Surrender. The moment we give him our life, he clears up things real quick. It always begins with surrender, just willing to give God everything and say, God, you have it. You have me. Number four, the desires of our heart. Proverbs 8, 17. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Speaking of wisdom, if you earnestly seek God and his wisdom and his truth, you'll find him. Bobby Richardson, second baseman for the New York Yankees, one, one time prayed this prayer at a banquet. Dear God, your will, nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. Amen. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee, what? The desires of thine heart. If God's controlling you, you're surrendered to God, you're filled with the Spirit of God, guess who's controlling your desires at that point? It would be God. Number five, open doors, open doors. 
Uh, God many times opens doors for us. We, we need to be willing to walk through the open doors, doors that God opens. You know, Satan can open doors too. But we don't need to carry a crowbar with us to be able to force it open. Most of the trouble we get into in getting out of God's will is when we use the crowbar. That door was just slightly open, and we try and help God with our crowbar. Ever try and help God open a door? It can be frustrating. The open door means, God, I'll walk through it. A closed door means, no, don't go. A closed door is just as much God's leading as an open door. Many times, God has to slam the door in our face to give us a message. First John 1, 7, what does he say? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Stay close to the Lord, and then walk through the open doors. I believe as we stay close to God, he opens doors that we could never open. Here's one, circumstances. Did you ever hear this? I know it's God's will because everything is working out good. Can, can the devil give you a job where you travel 50 weeks a year? Can he do that? Can he double your money in salary? Sure he can. Is that God's will? For you to abandon your family and church and home responsibilities? Not at all. Just because it's an open door does not mean that it is God's will. Just because circumstances are bad does not mean that you're not in the center of God's will. Just talk to Joseph. Was Joseph in God's will when he was in the pit? He was. Was Joseph in God's will when he was sold as a slave? He was. Was Joseph in God's will when he was serving in Potiphar's house? He was. Was he in God's will when he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and tempted? He was. Was he in God's will when he was in an Egyptian prison? He was. Bad circumstances, but he was in God's will. God said to Moses, I want you to go to Egypt, deliver the children of Israel. Uh, and he tried. And one day Moses said to God, God, can we talk? I came to Egypt. I did exactly what you told me to do. I went to Pharaoh, and it's worse. I mean, every day it's getting worse. They've taken away the straw for the brick making. Uh, they want the same number of bricks. Now they want more bricks. God says, that's all right. You're in the center of my will. The road to success is uphill all the way. You don't coast to victory, but God did give victory, didn't he? Ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of the Egyptian army, God took care of it. There's always a price. There's a guy who said, Lord, if, if the light is green at spruce and locust, I will know it is your will for me to do this. He said, lo and behold, the light was green. I only had to go around the block five times to get the, <laughs> the light green. Circumstances. Here's one, number seven, your gifts and abilities. Many times your gifts and abilities will help you understand God's guidance. God will give you gifts to fulfill God's calling. <clears throat> God will give you gifts to fulfill his will for your life. It's if it's God's will for you to be involved, say, in, in, in a music ministry of singing or playing in the orchestra, God's going to give you the ability or the talent to be able to sing or to be able to play. I, I, I didn't get an invitation to sing in the choir uh, or a solo piece from the wall, and Sarah did not ask me to, to play in the orchestra. I, I knew if, if she knew it was a desire in my heart, she would ask, probably just turn the microphone down. Uh, but you know, that, that's not my calling, that's not my talent, that's not my giftedness. Where God, God gifts, that's where he leads. Life's not complicated. God will give you gifts according to your calling and according to his will for your life. Always has, always will. God is going to call you right where your gifts are. Here's one, number eight, spending time in prayer. Just spending time with God. What did James say? If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not, it shall be given him. That is in the context of a trial. Count it all joy when you're in the trial. Ask God to show you and guide you and give you wisdom. But he says, ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven in with the wind and tossed. How true it is. What did Jesus do? 
Jesus went up into the mountain to be alone, to pray to God. He, he was always spending time in prayer. How better we would be if we would carve out some time for God, get alone with God, say, God, I, I don't have an answer, but you do. Just worship God, bask in his presence, lift up his name, sing songs to him, and if you're alone at the top of your lungs, tell him that you trust him, tell him that he's never failed you, tell him how his strength uh, endures to the end, how his grace is more than sufficient. Tell him that his ways are higher than your ways and you're going to trust in him. Tell him that his will is what you want more than life itself. God will give you a perfect peace and he will lead you and he will guide you. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in what? In prayer. In prayer. God will not tell you the complete will of God for your life all at once. And that's a good thing. Your job is is not to know the complete future will of God. Your job is to know and do the daily will of God, and that's today. How many times have we cheated ourselves out of the best that God has for us because we stopped and haven't gone forward because we couldn't see the end results? Just start walking. Just start walking. Uh, What if I don't know where it's going to end up? You don't need to know where it's going to end up. God knows. You just walk step by step, day by day, month by month, by faith. Someone wrote, I was regretting the past and fearing the future. Suddenly my Lord was speaking. My name is I Am. He paused. I waited. He continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it is hard I am not there. My name is not I was. When you live in the future with the problems and fears, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I will be. When you live in the moment, it is not hard. I am there. My name is I am. I am. And when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with you. He is a faithful shepherd. Follow the shepherd. Stay close to him. The steps of a good man, the steps of a good woman are ordered by the Lord and he directs our way. May we pray. Father, thank you that we can be filled with the knowledge of your will, that we can have wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we can walk worthy unto you, pleasing you in every good work, increasing in your knowledge, and that you will strengthen us with your glorious power, with patience, with with long-suffering, and with joyfulness. Our heads are bowed as we come into God's presence. God is not playing a game of hide-and-seek. His purpose is not to keep his will hid from you. It is possible for you to walk with God and to walk in the will of God. And when you walk with God, you're automatically in his will. God is the shepherd. We are the sheep. We hear his voice. We follow. So tonight, is there anything that is in your life you know God wants you to do and you're not doing it? Is there anything in your life that you're doing and God doesn't want you to do it? Walk worthy. Would you take a moment, do business with God? Ask him to help you to avoid those sins of omission, the sins of commission. How big is your God? He's big enough to guide you. Lord, tonight, thank you for 
giving us your word. Thank you for leading us by your spirit with peace, opening and closing doors. Thank you for good counsel we can get from godly people in our lives. We thank you for the desires of our heart that you put within us to fulfill. Lord, help us to always keep you supreme in our decisions, to dedicate all that we have, all that we are to you. We pray in Jesus' name.